What does it mean to be competent to stand trial? Well, first, a client must have a factual understanding of the charges and the legal proceedings. Second, the client must also have a rational understanding of the charges and the proceedings. And then finally, the client must have the ability to assist his or her attorney in the proceedings. So once an attorney raises the issue of competency, what is the next step? Well, the individual, usually a defendant, will go off to the evaluators and they will go through and prepare a report. And the report will include relevant background history, the standard stuff that you would expect. Uh, birthplace, mental health issues. Are the parents alive? How did they die? Are you married? Divorce? Do you keep in touch with your exes? Uh, was, was there any abuse or neglect growing up? Uh, the current living situation, employment history. Employment history would include all employment history if requested. Any medical history, if there's anything relevant as it relates to the arrest. Uh, do you have nightmares? Uh, do you have any intrusive thoughts? Are you anxious? Have you ever taken prescription for any mental health issues? Substance abuse. Do you drink alcohol or drugs? How frequently? Have you ever done drugs? They're going to ask about your legal history. Ask if the client's ever uh, broken the law. Ask if the client's ever had any convictions. Then they'll explore the mental status examination. The Evaluator will look at the appearances, whether there are any scars, tattoos, piercing, tremors in the hands, restlessness, uh, height, weight, their gait, orientation. Was the orientation of the person appropriate for the uh, place, time, and purpose of the evaluation? What is their mood? Do they seem anxious, irritable, or pessimistic? Are they making appropriate or inappropriate comments or nervous laughing? Uh, they'll talk about sleep and appetite. How has your sleep been? Do you have any issues with appetite lately? Communication. Was the client's speech throughout the evaluation coherent? Then they go on to perceptions, thought processes. Were they logical? Then they'll explore whether somebody is paranoid, any unusual thoughts, perceptions. Uh, the clients asked whether they have paranoid thoughts or hallucinations. Then they'll look for any delusional disorders. Now, this comes up quite a bit because we're talking about it in Letitia Stauk as well as Lori Vallow. Now, there are several delusional disorders. And remember, I'm not a doctor, but I've read a lot of these reports and very familiar with a lot of these delusional disorders. Now, the first is the erotomaniac type, where the central theme of the delusion is because the person is in love with an individual. The delusion is often a romanticized love rather than just a sexual attraction. And the person who they are in love with is usually of a higher status, and they will make efforts to contact that person. Usually, if it involves men in this kind of delusional order, often, uh, come into contact with the law trying to pursue the object of their delusion. And they often believe that they are trying to rescue the person that they are in love with. Now there's a subtype and it's called the grandiose type where the central theme of the delusion is the conviction of having some great talent or insight. Hmm, sound familiar? The individual might have the delusion of having a relationship with a prominent person or the delusion may have a religious content, i.e. the person believes that he or she has a special message from a deity. There is also the jealous subtype of a delusional disorder where the theme of the person's delusion is that his or her spouse or lover is being unfaithful. The person will often uh, come to the conclusion based upon bits of evidence that are collected to justify the delusion. Now, often the person will attempt to intervene secretly following their spouses or restricting the spouse's autonomy. The next subtype is the persecutory type, and it applies when the central theme of the delusion involves the person's belief that they are being conspired against, spied on, followed, poisoned, or drugged. The person will often engage in repeated attempts to obtain satisfaction by appealing to the courts and other governmental agencies. People in this subtype are often resentful and angry and may resort to violence against the people that they think are actually hurting them. The next subtype is the somatic, which applies when the central theme of the delusion involves bodily functions or sensations. The most common are the person's convictions that he or she emits a foul odor from their skin, mouth, rectum, or vagina, or that they have an infestation in their skin, or that they have an internal parasite. If none of these apply to the person being evaluated, the delusional disorder could be classified as mixed typed, where no one delusion theme predominates, or unspecified type, where the dominant delusion type cannot 
clearly be determined or it is not yet described in the specific types. The determination of whether delusions are bizarre is especially important in distinguishing between a delusional disorder and schizophrenia. It can be difficult to judge, especially across different cultures. Delusions are deemed bizarre if they are clearly impossible or not understandable. An example would be if someone said they believed that someone took out their organs and replace them with someone else's organs, or even though they have no wounds or scars. A non-bizarre delusion would be something that can conceivably occur in real life. For example, being followed, poisoned, or being deceived by a lover. An individual cultural and religious background must be taken into account in evaluating the possible presence of a delusional disorder. Some cultures have widely held and culturally sanctioned beliefs that might be considered delusional in other cultures. The age and onset of the delusional disorder is variable, ranging from adolescence to later in life. The persecutory type is the most common subtype and the course is variable. The disorder may be chronic, although waxing and waning, if the preoccupation with the delusional beliefs often occurs. So I hope that puts some insight into delusional disorders. And understand, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I'm just an attorney that's had to deal with this stuff quite a bit. And tomorrow we'll talk about how the professionals determine if somebody is malingering.